Hello, everyone. Welcome to Neuro Classroom. So what we are going to see today is uh, constraint induced movement therapy. Constraint induced movement therapy, as you all know, uh, has a very good uh, efficacy when uh, treating stroke patients and it is being advocated everywhere. It is one of the uh, intervention that has a good amount of uh, um, evidence going forward in uh, stroke rehabilitation. So what is a major problem in stroke patients? Uh, if you see, the most important problem here after stroke has uh, occurred is the CNS function is going to be compromised because of the CNS inactivity, the patient is not going to uh, move properly and the movement is going to be affected. So we know all these things. That is why we call them as a hemiplegic patient. So there is a movement disorder. So subsequently, you can see in this diagram what happens when there is a movement disorder. There are two consequences that are happening. One is less movement. The patient's magnitude of movement is coming down. Next is unsuccessful motor attempts. If the patient is trying to move the upper extremity or if he is trying to stand with his leg uh, weight supported, uh, there is an unsuccessful attempt. So what happens to this unsuccessful attempt if it continuously happens? It results in a compensatory behavior. The patient tries to do adopt a different type of uh, activity. For example, if he's not able to uh, grasp a bottle of water like this in the forward plane, he does it like doing it this way. So this is what we have seen already that it's a learned abnormality. So why this happens? Because of an unsuccessful attempt. He either attempts a compensatory pattern. What happens if he attempts a compensatory pattern? There is a positive reinforcement. What is meant by positive reinforcement? By doing like this, he'll be able to accomplish the activity. So he's encouraged to move in this pattern every time. What happens? He keeps on moving in the abnormal pattern only because he is getting a little bit of success with this type of movement. This is called as positive reinforcement he's keep on moving in this abnormal pattern and he starts learning this abnormal pattern and he starts doing this pattern as if this is the normal pattern. We all have seen people who have got some ankle injury or a knee injury. Once uh, they get this injury, they start walking in an antalgic gait pattern. So what happens uh, here? The loading phase of the affected extremity is reduced compared to the uh, unaffected extremity. So they walk in a typical pattern of walking. So this pattern of walking, if they keep on continuing to do for a long period of time and the pain becomes chronic and they are not treating that particular condition, um, maybe it takes six months for the patient to recover from that particular injury. What happens? Subsequently, his walking pattern also differs. Even if the biological problem that has happened to him has been eliminated, he starts walking in the same pattern. So it becomes a learned abnormality. That is what is happening in stroke patients also. It is not the synergy. It is not the abnormal tone that is making the patient to move in this typical pattern, but it is a learned abnormality and the positive reinforcement that is making the patient to move in this particular pattern. Okay, what happens once this is mastered? Less effective behavior is strengthened. So the, the uh, strategy what the patient is adopting now is a less effective strategy because for doing this, he consumes an enormous amount of energy. So this is an abnormal movement pattern which is being uh, mastered. And subsequently what happens, he becomes a learned non-use or normally permanent reversal possible, that is, uh, his normal patterns are not used at all. That is called as a learned non-use. Non-use here pertains to the normal movement pattern. He's not able to involve himself in a normal movement pattern. Okay. And uh, 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 when this is being uh, uh, done, uh, parallelly, if you see what happens because of a depressed CNS activity, we saw that there is going to be less amount of movement. Subsequently, what happens? Less amount of movement. Contraction of the cortical representation area. That is the cortical area which are producing this movement. You might have seen a man lying down in the cerebral cortex. The representation area in your uh, brain uh, 
uh, where you see that the hand has the largest amount of representation and your tongue and lips have got the largest area of representation. So how many neurons are divided and given for each areas of the body is called as the cortical representation area. So this cortical representation area, if a patient is not using his upper extremity, the upper extremity representation area becomes shrunk. It, it goes for a reduced volume. Number of nerve fibers here are going to be significantly reduced because he is not using it. This is what we call it as use it or lose it. Even in a normal patient, even in a normal person, um, we see that the table bound people, uh, they keep on working in a forward flexed posture. Their uh, multi feeders and their back muscles go for uh, atrophy. How this happens, they are not using it, so they are losing it. So obviously the represent representation area for these particular muscles in the brain are also uh, proved to be significantly less active and uh, that's when, when a patient uh, who's long uh, is used to long sitting pattern starts running to catch a bus, he gets a back pain because his motor programming around the back has been diminished because of the contraction of the cortical representation, representation areas. So what happens subsequently, the cortical representation area is reduced, the, move, uh, the movement more effortful for doing a small movement his effort is increased because in the brain uh, normally if one lakh nerve fibers are doing this activity now only 500 uh, neurons are there to do the activity so obviously for these neurons to do the activity of one lakh neurons it is going to be very tedious and the movement is going to become very effortful he's going to do a lot of movement do a simple activity for again, this leads into a learned non-use, okay? The third thing what happens here is because of the reduced activity, uh, that is a uh, depressed CNS activity, unsuccessful motor attempts. Once the patient goes for an unsuccessful motor uh, uh, attempts, uh, he experiences uh, failure. So this failure is uh, not going to motivate him. This is going to negatively reinforce the patient and uh, that is going to give him more pain and his movement pattern, if he views in a mirror, it is going to be incoordinated and he always compares his affected limb with the unaffected limb. That is when uh, the patient starts becoming uh, highly depressed about their activity. They always complain, as a physiotherapist, you might have come across, this hand is moving, but this hand is not at all moving. Every day they used to repeat to a uh, therapist. So this is a sort of a mindset to which they go. And uh, subsequently what happens, behavior suppression and masked ability. Even if the patient is able to do certain activity, he will not try that activity because the behavior is suppressive behavior. That is, he's suppressing himself because of the depression and the failure what he has faced in the previous attempt. And his small ability which is there, uh, the potential, uh, potential recovery uh, that is available in this patient is going to be masked. So what happens? He is going to become a even worse patient. So all these three things, that is less movement, unsuccessful attempt and compensatory behaviors are the three very important things that results in uh, learned abnormality or learned non-use. But they are normally uh, permanent. If they, once they are learned, the abnormality is learned, they become normally very permanent. And one thing that physiotherapists should understand that is it is reversible. That is the scope here. It is reversible. Reversal is possible. What have to be done for the patient to reverse all those things? He has to go back to this point one. So in order to reverse all these things, he has to go and attest this portion. Even if he is not attesting this area, if nobody is attending to the patient and the patient becomes uh, uh, unattended by the physiotherapist, there is again a negative reinforcement where this leads to again a cyclic activity of these three and compounding to that, the patient is going to become more chronic and chronic and 
the reversal is not going to be possible. Okay, so constraint induced movement therapy has clearly given you an idea that it is not the spasticity or the tone that is causing the problem. It is a less movement, unsuccessful motor attempts and the compensatory behavior the patient attempts to overcome their weakness. That is, these are the three major important problems in the stroke patients. Okay, so what they have come across, they, uh, they came up with uh, uh, a plan where learned non-use can be treated. Okay, so here is one more flow chart. There is a learned non-use. The patient is not using the upper extremity example because of which he is having a uh, masked recovery of the upper limb. He's uh, the normal recovery which is supposed to happen is being masked because he's not using it. So you have to encourage the patient to use it. So what happens if there is a masked recovery of the upper limb, increased motivation access function, uh, that is, in this stage when we uh, interfere with the patient and we are increasing the motivation to access the functional activities for him to do his day-to-day -day activities, what happens? His affected limb becomes a useful limb. He starts using the affected limb. Okay, so once he starts using the affected limb, there is a positive reinforcement. And when he's moving, that movement should be in a proper uh, direction and it should be in a normal coordinated pattern. So what happens once he starts moving it, there is a positive reinforcement for a reinforcement of the normal movement as a result of which uh, he keeps on practicing, further practicing and the practice results in more reinforcement and subsequently the limb use in the real life situation that is the um, functional use of the uh, limbs in the day-to-day -day activities the uh, familial activities, the social activities, occupational activities, self-care activities are all being facilitated. So what is the key here? He is, the key is the increased motivation for functional use. And somehow we have to motivate the patient to use the upper extremity. We as a physiotherapist always tell patients to move, but what problem happens is we attend to the patient only for one hour of a day. Uh, subsequently, what happens, we leave the whole patient's house and the patient starts doing his uh, routine uh, sedentary activity and the caretakers also do not um, help the patient in doing these activities and they don't guide them as such because of which, again, after 24 hours, you are going to attend the patient and he's going to start afresh from zero. This is the major problem in uh, treating stroke patients because of which the patients are not recovering. You see a lot of residual impairment in stroke patients simply because they have not been attended to um, a physiotherapist for, subse uh, for a substantial amount of time in a day. So that is a major problem. So that uh, uh, problem is also going to be solved by means of uh, constraint induced movement therapy.